Now let's tur turn to talking about work and volunteerism. So work and retirement are complex, as we've already noticed um, and, and talked about. Uh, as mentioned, the median age for retirement is about 61 and a half for men and 62 for women. Um, when adults first retire, it's referred to as the liberation stage, which is the first post-retirement year. They enjoy freedom being away from work, but it's very short-lived because then there's two to 15 years trying to reorient yourself to not having to work, right? So reasons for retirement include uh, forced to by your workplace or having the financial resources to stop working. So you're either um, booted out or you'll want to go. Workforce reentry is a widespread trend and um, you know it results from financial problems and older adults actually needing to take up part-time jobs to maintain their lifestyle and Social security or retirement benefits may be cut, which also means that you want to have more income. Longevity is increasing, as we said, and so adults now have to save for about 25 years of retirement, which is a lot of money and a lot of resources to save. Older adults will change jobs after retirement, and it's common for them to also um, switch to part-time work, which is less stressful and more flexible. Often they end up working for themselves in some way, and usually changing a job means there's no benefits and no social standing. However, if one enjoys the job and finds it fulfilling, even um, less money and no insurance are not a barrier to that. In the U.S., we are very, very work oriented. And so it's central to people's mental and physical health and their sense of self identity, as we noted in our young and middle aged adults. And a loss of the worker role can lead to stress and decreased well being psychologically and emotionally. Also, there's a loss of social network, material wealth, and structure. So, with our, again, with our, um, early and middle adulthood phases, we talked about how social, socializing and community integration happens as a result of work. Um, you, you're friends with the people you work with, and, it, and work provides a very solid structure, which most of us really um, benefit from, even if we don't always like, like having to get up at six in the morning or what have you. The structure is actually very reassuring and supportive. So with regard to retirement employment, we have something called bridge employment, which is any paid work after an individual retires or they start receiving a pension. There's career bridge employment, which is working within one's field under different conditions, such as a different employer, part-time versus full-time, et cetera. There's non-career employment, which is working outside of your career after you retire. And there's re-careering, um, which is making a career change as an older adult. In 20, uh, 2009, 27% of full-time workers at a, between ages of 51 and 55, so in middle adulthood, actually changed occupations. And as we've talked about in um, young adulthood and middle adulthood, uh, it's more common for people to change jobs and change careers nowadays. And in fact, more new, actual new occupations in the sense of jobs um, are being developed and older ones that people may have worked in for many, many years are going away. So you can see how it would be very common for somebody to re-career. It's also common for people with lower levels of formal education um, or people who are no longer physically able to work to do this re-careering. There are also um, very great benefits to volunteering, and that is something that older adults engage in. Um, the generation gap uh, is bridged because older adults can interact with younger generations and um, teach them things and 
uh, younger folks can interact with older folks, which is also stimulating and positive for them. There are cognitive health benefits in terms of keeping the brain active and um, lowering the risk of dementia. There's physical health benefits, so opportunities for physical activity in, in with volunteering, social health, preventing isolation, and longevity. So frequent volunteers actually live longer. Um, there's lower rates of depression, fewer disabilities, higher levels of self-reported well-being. Older Americans who volunteer frequently actually live longer. And finally, we come to death and dying. For most of human history, death has been, an accepted, has been accepted as an unanticipated, unavoidable, and quick stage of life and event. Um, today, because of all the medical advances, death is less of an everyday event. We extend people's life, and we extend people's lives even when they are very ill or very disabled. And there's an ethical issue there, um, one that we could get into during our discussion if you'd like to. But there is an ethical decision about the extension of life beyond the quality of life. So the average person who turns 65 in 2009 can expect to live almost another 20 years, right? And now we're, um, uh, we're in 2021 this year, and so that number has actually increased. So after retirement, there is a long period. Um, older people can uh, plan for their own death more effectively, but there's a concern for a good death. And a good death is characterized by being fast, painless, dignified, and occurring at home. So it's a, it's a complex process, right? And we want our older adults to really be an active participant and in charge of this aspect of their life and in as much as is possible. The good death um, can be assisted by three innovations, hospice care, palliative care, and end of life decision making. And we're gonna look at those briefly. So hospice care um, is, uh, a hospice is a place where terminally ill patients or clients receive palliative care. So it's not care that's gonna make anybody better, but it is gonna make them comfortable and, um, and feel supported, basically. It can be provided in any um, setting, but it's often administered at home after a physician has determined that there's no more responsiveness to any conventional medical treatments. Um, there, are, there is skilled medical treatment, but not death-defying interventions. So it preserves one's human dignity, and the dying person and their family are considered the unit of care. So just like we saw at the beginning of life where the family unit was this, was this unit, right? Um, so it goes at the end of life with hospice care. Hospices try to help as many people as possible, but they don't reach everyone. You have to be diagnosed as terminally ill within the last six months uh, and in the last six months of your life. Um, you have to accept a diagnosis of a terminal illness. And hospices were typically designed for all adults with terminal cancer, not older adults with severe illnesses. It is expensive care, and its availability depends on one's location. So there's a lot of ins and outs with it, but it is an extremely powerful innovation for having a good death. Next up is palliative care. And palliative care as opposed uh, to hospice um, care is um, often provided during a stay at a hospital or another medical facility. It's designed mainly to relieve pain and suffering of the patient and by extension their family. It can still involve efforts to cure the patient's disease or could be used in conjunction with life-sustaining treatments and the the um, patient is not required to give up their fight for recovery. So a little bit different than hospice care, but can go with hospice care in some instances. 
And finally, end of life decision making. So this involves explicit guidelines for the person's preferences for what happens at the end of their life. And this happens hopefully before he or she becomes incapable of making those decisions or expressing their wants and needs about medical care. So a living will is one of the documents that's used. Um, it specifies when and what medical intervention should occur. And hospitals will ask for living wills or advanced directives upon admission. So it's an important document that determines um, how and what care will be delivered. There's also healthcare proxies. If a person chosen to make medical, and it involves a person chosen to make medical decisions if the patient is unable to make his or her own decisions. So important to determine who you want to make those decisions and to be sure that you trust them to make the decisions that you want versus the decisions that they emotionally or psychologically are more inclined to make. Now there's some problems with designated proxies. Um, they, they don't necessarily measure, um, choose measures that the dying person really wants. They may involve uh, clashing cultural values. They um, also may involve family members who um, disagree very bitterly about what constitutes suffering and how much suffering is quote unquote acceptable. And finally, even if the patient is signed a will, uh, living will and a specified proxy, the hospital staff may not abide by those decisions. So it's tough, right? And we have these innovations in place to help with it, but death and dying for all of us, even if it is swift and painless, is still um, can be fraught with difficulty and challenge. And finally, um, a little note of levity. So before you go, Wheatland Manor seniors have some advice that they'd like to give you. Alice, age 94, says advice for the younger generation. Smile and the world smiles with you. Doris, age 89, advice for the younger generation. Take more time to enjoy life. And Lois, who's age 93, says advice for the younger generation, try to love, not hate. That brings us to the end of the presentation. Please jot down any questions that you have, anything you'd like to discuss, anything that's not clear, or you'd like more information on, and we will address it when we meet in person in class. There is a comprehensive reference list for your, um, uh, for your reference, a reference list for your reference. And I thank you so much for your time and attention, and I will look forward to seeing you in class. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.